Steven Crowder is a conservative comedian who makes videos on YouTube. He's pretty popular. He's got close to 4 million subscribers and tens of millions of viewers. His stuff isn't for everyone, but so? If you don't like his videos, watch Colbert. It's a free country, or it used to be. The press is working to change that. A few days ago, a writer at Vox.com demanded that YouTube ban Steven Crowder. Why? For the crime of insulting him. Amazingly, many in the Washington press corps agreed. You shouldn't be allowed to mock talentless Vox writers, they said. Apparently, it's a new addition to the First Amendment. Turns out the Vox writer in question is hardly a sympathetic figure. Hardly. He's got a long history of leveling racist attacks online. He's called for physically assaulting people he disagrees with politically, even as he whines about being oppressed himself. He is, in other words, a classic archetype on the left. He's a fascist posing as a victim. No sensible adult would take him seriously. And yet YouTube is obeying his commands. The company announced it will demonetize Steven Crowder's YouTube channel, killing his business. They did this even though in a statement they admitted that Crowder had broken no rules. Vox, amazingly, meanwhile, released a series of statements demanding that YouTube censor Crowder entirely, not just demonetize him, but bounce him off. So much for freedom of the press. The real question, though, for the rest of us is, why is this allowed to continue? Let's stop pretending. Platforms like Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, these are the modern public square, obviously. Congress has acknowledged them as such. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act gives tech companies special immunity from being sued for defamation or fraud, immunity that we don't have on this channel, for example. And the purpose of this is to allow, quote, true diversity of political discourse. It's a high-minded cause. The effect is immunity, and that immunity is worth tens of billions of dollars. It's one of the reasons the owners of Twitter and Facebook and Google are so rich. You guaranteed that to them through your representatives in the Congress. And yet, in return, these tech companies violate the terms of the deal every minute of every day. They're not open forums. They're ongoing exercises in control and censorship. The question is, how long will the rest of us stand for this? Glenn Greenwald co-founded The Intercept, and he joins us tonight. Glenn, thanks so much for coming on. So you don't have to be a fan of Steven Crowder or, what, or, or anyone to see this as a threat. A threat to one person's speech is a threat to all of our speech, is it not? Yeah, I mean, I personally find Steven Crowder to be uh, a, just a contemptuous cretin as a commentator. I do think he's an infantile bully which is, and bigot, which are not words I easily invoke. He didn't just criticize Carlos Maza. He mocked him for being gay and for being Latino. He used a lisp and things to ridicule him, sent a lot of harassment his way. But that's the point, Tucker, is that censorship advocates want our brains to only go to that most primitive first level of do we hate this person and are we therefore glad that they're being censored without thinking about the framework being endorsed or the consequences right. that ensue from it. I mean, I personally, it resonates a lot for me because I've dealt with harassment far greater than what Carlos Maza is complaining of. I'm a gay man in a country, Brazil, that just elected a president driven by intense anti-gay animus. My husband's a member of Congress and the oppositional party. We've been mocked and derided with our sexual orientation, not by a random YouTuber but by the president of the country himself on Twitter and his family members who are elected members of Congress. And it would never occur to me to run to social media companies to beg for censorship because, in part, it's just something that comes with the territory of being a public figure, but more so right. because I don't want to live in a world where our discourse is policed and determined by benevolent overlords who run Silicon Valley companies You know, who are always going to cater to the most powerful faction. That's what happened here. YouTube caved in, not in defense of the marginalized person, but in defense of the powerful one, the one who, despite exactly. being gay and Latino, works for a major media conglomerate. And that's what they're always going to do is defend the mob and defend the powerful at the expense of those who are, are marginalized. <laughs> that is such a good point. They're defending the power. Re really quick, I just have to ask you, so you don't have immunity. You don't have the immunity that YouTube, for example, enjoys, was granted by Congress. You, you founded a pretty big and well-known site. If you libel someone, you can be sued. They're immune from that. Why do they retain that immunity? 
That's a really good question. And the reason is, is because originally these companies like YouTube, Google, Twitter, Facebook were supposed to be like AT&T, which are just neutral public platforms, right? So if Steven Crowder wants to call someone using AT&T and organize an anti-vox rally. Nobody expects AT&T to stop him because the idea is it's just a platform for people to use. That's what Silicon Valley companies originally were supposed to be and they got immunity for it. In reality, this power to censor was not one that they wanted. It was one that was foisted upon them right. amazingly largely by journalists who were demanding exactly. that they remove voices from the internet. Imagine going into journalism and then begging corporations to silence and censor people. That's the real reason they ended up in this position. <laughs> that is such so nicely put. I gotta ask you quickly, federal prosecutors recently revealed an 18 count indictment against WikiLeaks, the founder Julian Assange. He's being charged under the Espionage Act for his role in helping to release leaked government documents. You've been very close to the story from day one. And your point has been that this could criminalize ordinary journalism. What do you mean? Well, a lot of your viewers probably remember that under the Obama administration, um, a lot of journalists were targeted and called criminals for working with sources, including James Rosen, right. who was called the conspirator for working with the source who leaked to him classified material. But at least they never went out and actually criminalized the people who published that material. The Trump Justice Department has taken that step now by saying that WikiLeaks is criminal, not because they stole the information they didn't, but because they published it. And I think we've all seen on the left and right over the past several decades that the CIA, the NSA, the FBI are agencies that will abuse their power unless they have great transparency shined on them. WikiLeaks has done that, sometimes angering the left, sometimes angering the right, and that's why they want to criminalize Julian Assange, both to punish him for bringing transparency to the deep state, but also to create a theory hoping that everybody hates Assange, just like Steven Crowder, and therefore doesn't think about the consequences, that says exactly. that if you're somebody who publishes secret information, you can be turned into a criminal. And that's why it's so dangerous to press freedom. That is, that's the key point. They pick someone, they whip the mob into a frenzy. Here's the person you should hate, and they distract us from the consequences of what they're doing, the consequences to us. And I thank you, Glenn Greenwald, for reminding us of those consequences. Appreciate it.